Chapter 16 of The Ghost Pirates by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ghost Pirates. Chapter 16 The Ghost Pirates. At the moment when eight bells actually went, I was in the forecastle, talking to four of the other watch. Suddenly, away aft, I heard shouting and then on the deck overhead came the loud thudding of someone pumping with a capstan bar. Straightway I turned and made a run for the port doorway, along with the four other men. We rushed out through the doorway onto the deck. It was getting dusk, but that did not hide from me a terrible and extraordinary sight. All along the port rail there was a queer, undulating grayness that moved downwards inboard and spread over the decks. As I looked, I found that I saw more clearly in a most extraordinary way. And suddenly all the moving grayness resolved into hundreds of strange men. In the half-light they looked unreal and impossible, as though there had come upon us the inhabitants of some fantastic dream-world. My God, I thought I was mad. They swarmed in upon us in a great wave of murderous, living shadows. From some of the men who must have been going aft for roll-call there rose into the evening air a loud, awful shouting. Aloft! yelled someone, but as I looked aloft I saw that the horrible things were swarming there in scores and scores. Jesus Christ! shrieked a man's voice, cut short, and my glance dropped from aloft to find two of the men who had come out from the forecastle with me rolling upon the deck. They were two indistinguishable masses that writhed here and there across the planks. The brutes fairly covered them. From them came muffled little shrieks and gasps, and there I stood, and with me were the other two men. A man darted past me into the forecastle, with two grey men on his back, and I heard them kill him. The two men by me ran suddenly across the forehatch and up the starboard ladder onto the forecastle head. Yet, almost in the same instant, I saw several of the grey men disappear up the other ladder. From the forecastle head above I heard the two men commence to shout, and this died away into a loud scuffling. At that I turned to see whether I could get away. I stared round, hopelessly. And then, with two jumps, I was on the pigsty, and from there upon the top of the deckhouse. I threw myself flat and waited breathlessly. All at once it seemed to me that it was darker than it had been the previous moment, and I raised my head very cautiously. I saw that the ship was enveloped in great billows of mist, and then, not six feet from me, I made out someone lying face downwards. It was Tammy. I felt safer now that we were hidden by the mist, and I crawled to him. He gave a quick gasp of terror when I touched him, but when he saw who it was he started to sob like a little kid. "'Hush!' I said. "'For God's sake, be quiet!' But I need not have troubled, for the shrieks of the men being killed down on the decks all around us drowned every other sound. I knelt up and glanced round and then aloft. Overhead I could make out dimly the spars and sails, and now as I looked I saw that the Tagallants and Royals had been unloosed and were hanging in the buntlines. Almost in the same moment the terrible crying of the poor beggars about the deck ceased. And there succeeded an awful silence, in which I could distinctly hear Tammy sobbing. I reached out and shook him. "'Be quiet! Be quiet!' I whispered intensely. "'They'll hear us!' At my touch and whisper he struggled to become silent and then, overhead, I saw the six yards being swiftly mastheaded. Scarcely were the sails set when I heard the swish and flick of gaskets being cast adrift on the lower yards, and realized that ghostly things were at work there. For a moment or so there was silence, and I made my way cautiously to the after end of the house, and peered over. Yet, because of the mist, I could see nothing. Then, abruptly, from behind me, came a single wail of sudden pain and terror from Tammy. It ended instantly in a sort of choke. 
I stood up in the mist and ran back to where I had left the kid. But he had gone. I stood dazed. I felt like shrieking out loud. Above me I heard the flaps of the course being tumbled off the yards. Down upon the decks there were the noises of a multitude working in a weird, inhuman silence. Then came the squeal and rattle of blocks and braces aloft. They were squaring the yards. I remained standing. I watched the yards squared, and then I saw the sails fill suddenly. An instant later the deck of the house upon which I stood became canted forward. The slope increased, so that I could scarcely stand, and I grabbed at one of the wire winches. I wondered, in a stunned sort of way, what was happening. Almost directly afterwards, from the deck on the port side of the house, there came a sudden, loud, human scream. And immediately, from different parts of the decks, there rose, afresh, some most horrible shouts of agony from odd men. These grew into an intense screaming that shook my heart up, and there came again a noise of desperate, brief fighting. Then a breath of cold wind seemed to play in the mist, and I could see down the slope of the deck. I looked below me, towards the bows. The jibboom was plunged right into the water, and, as I stared, the bows disappeared into the sea. The deck of the house became a wall to me, and I was swinging from the winch, which was now above my head. I watched the ocean lap over the edge of the forecastle head and rush down onto the main deck, roaring into the empty forecastle. And still, all around me, came crying of the lost sailor men. I heard something strike the corner of the house above me, with a dull thud, and then I saw Plummer plunge down into the flood beneath. I remembered that he had been at the wheel. The next instant the water had leapt to my feet. There came a drear chorus of bubbly screams, a roar of waters, and I was going swiftly down into the darkness. I let go of the winch and struck out madly, trying to hold my breath. There was a loud singing in my ears. It grew louder. I opened my mouth. I felt I was dying. And then, thank God, I was at the surface breathing. For the moment I was blinded with the water, in my agony of breathlessness. Then, growing easier, I brushed the water from my eyes, and so, not three hundred yards away, I made out a large ship, floating almost motionless. At first I could scarcely believe I saw a right. Then, as I realized that indeed there was yet a chance of living, I started to swim towards you. You know the rest. And you think, said the captain interrogatively, and stopped short. No, replied Jessop, I don't think. I know. None of us think. It's a gospel fact. People talk about queer things happening at sea, but this isn't one of them. This is one of the real things. You've all seen queer things perhaps more than I have. It depends. But they don't go down in the log. These kinds of things never do. This one won't. At least, not as it's really happened. He nodded his head slowly and went on, addressing the captain more particularly. I'll bet, he said deliberately, that you'll enter it in the logbook something like this. May 18th, latitude south, longitude west. 2 p.m. Light winds from the south and east. Sighted a full-rigged ship on the starboard bow. Overhauled her in the first dog-watch. Signaled her, but received no response. During the second dog-watch, she steadily refused to communicate. About eight bells, it was observed that she seemed to be settling by the head, and a minute later she foundered suddenly, bows foremost, with all her crew. Put out a boat and picked up one of the men an A.B. by the name of Jessup. He was quite unable to give any explanation of the catastrophe. And you too. He made a gesture at the first and second mates. We'll probably sign your names to it, and so will I, and perhaps one of your A.B.'s. Then, when we get home, they'll print a report of it in the newspapers, and people will talk about the unseaworthy ships. 
Maybe some of the experts will talk rot about rivets and defective plates and so forth. He laughed cynically, then he went on. And, you know, when you come to think of it, there's no one except our own selves will ever know how it happened, really. The shellbacks don't count. They're only beastly, drunken brutes of common sailors, poor devils. No one would think of taking anything they said as anything more than a damned cuffer. Besides, the beggars only tell these things when they're half boozed. They wouldn't then, for fear of being laughed at, only they're not responsible. He broke off and looked round at us. The skipper and the two mates nodded their heads in silent assent. Appendix The Silent Ship I'm the third mate of the Sangier, the vessel that picked up Jessup, you know. He's asked us to write a short note of what we saw from our side and sign it. The old man set me on the job, as he says I can put it better than he can. Well, it was in the first dog watch that we came up with her, the Mortzestus, I mean. It was in the second dog watch that it happened. The mate and I were on the poop watching her. You see, we'd signaled her, and she'd not taken any notice and that seemed queer, as we couldn't have been more than three or four hundred yards off her port beam, and it was a fine evening, so that we could have almost had a tea-fight, if they'd seemed a pleasant crowd. As it was, we called them a set of sulky swine and left it at that, though we still kept our hoist up. All the same, you know, we watched her a lot, and I remembered, even then, I thought it queer how quiet she was. We couldn't even hear her bell go, and I spoke to the mate about it, and he said he'd been noticing the same thing. Then, about six bells, they shortened her right down to topsails. And I can tell you, that made us stare more than ever, as anyone can imagine. And I remember we noticed then especially that we couldn't hear a single sound from her, even when the hall yards were let go. And, you know, without the glass, I saw their old man singing out something and we didn't get a sound of it, and we should have been able to hear every word. Then, just before eight bells, the thing Jessops told us about happened. Both the mate and the old man said they could see men going up her side a bit indistinct, you know, because it was getting dusk. But the second mate and I half thought we did and half thought we didn't. But there was something queer. We all knew that, and it looked like a sort of moving mist along her side. I know I felt pretty funny, but it wasn't the sort of thing, of course, to be sure and serious about until you were sure. After the maid and the captain had said they saw the men boarding her, we began to hear sounds from her, very queer at first, and rather like a phonograph makes when it's getting up speed. Then the sounds came properly from her, and we heard them shouting and yelling, and, you know, I don't know even now just what I really thought. I was all so queer and mixed. The next thing I remember, there was a thick mist round the ship, and then all the noise was shut off, as if it were all the other side of a door. But we could still see her masts and spars and sails above the misty stuff. And both the captain and the mate said they could see me aloft. And I thought I could, but the second mate wasn't sure. All the same, though, the sails were all loosed in about a minute, it seemed, and the yards mastheaded. We couldn't see the courses above the mist, but Jessop says they were loose too and sheeted home along the upper sails. Then we saw the yards squared, and I saw the sails fill bang up with wind. And yet, you know, ours were slatting. The next thing was the one that hit me more than anything. Her mast took a cant forward and then I saw her stern come up out of the mist that was round her. Then, all in an instant, we could hear sounds from the vessel again. And I tell you, the men didn't seem to be shouting, but screaming. Her stern went higher. It was most extraordinary to look at. And then she went plunk down, head foremost, right bang into the mist stuff. It's all right what Jessop says, and when we saw him swimming, I was the one who spotted him, we got out a boat quicker than a windjammer ever got out a boat before, I should think. The captain and the mate and the second and I are all going to sign this. Signed, William Nauston, Master, 
J. E. G. Adams, first mate. Ed Brown, second mate. Jack T. Evan, third mate. The End of The Ghost Pirates by William Hope Hodgson